Greetings to everyone present. My name is Ankit Malhotra. I am the co-founder and president of the Jindal Society of International Law. It is an honor and a pleasure for us to host Professor Christian Tams. But before I introduce him formally, let me share a few words about the Center for UN Studies, which was created and is aimed to develop a learning platform on opportunities and limits of the United Nations by enhancing research and building knowledge on how the United Nations systems work, both in terms of institutional development and in terms of promotion and implementation of various multilateral policies. The center fits well with the global vision and aspirations of the law school and university writ large. The Jinnah Society of International Law is a student-led initiative under the ages of the Center for the Study of United Nations and is run expertly and spearheaded by Professor Dr. Weston Dubowski. We're only 11 months old and were launched on the 18th day of November 2020. The society was launched by the Herbert and Rose Rubin Professor of International Law, Professor Jose Enrique Alvarez of New York University, with our founding Vice Chancellor, Professor Dr. Rajkumar, along with Professor Dr. Weston Dubowski and a very dear friend of the society, Professor Dr. Mohan Kumar. A fall lecture series of 2021, exploring the ecosystem of international law and reimagining international organizations, build upon the introductions given in the spring lecture series that the society conducted. The fall lecture series endeavors to study the different contours of international law. To assist in the study, the speakers will cover and address respective areas of research and practice that they have honed over the years. Given the vast ecosystem of the engagement of international law in it, the society aims to study the fragmentation and fertilization of the various disciplines in this ecosystem. The common denominator in the fall lecture series is to enhance and provide a deeper understanding of international law to international lawyers. The society for its members is a well of knowledge and a quorum of thought provoking discussions it should be the resultant of its engagements with experts aimed at exploring this ecosystem of international law and international organizations. Professor Dr. Christian Dams is a profession, professor of international law at the University of Glasgow, where he directs the Center for International Law and Security. He is also a member of the board of the European Society of International Law and the Council of the German Society of International Law. Professor Tam's scholarship focuses on disputes, dispute settlement, investment law, and state responsibility. Recent works of his include the Statute of the International Court of Justice by the Zimmerman and Oxford in 2019. One of the leading texts of the law and procedures of the World Court and the international courts and tribunals and violent conflicts. An academic member of the Matrix Chambers in London, Professor Tams is frequently instructed in interstate and investment state disputes. In recent years, he has acted in proceedings before the International Court of Justice, the Iran US Claims Tribunal, and as he put it, is a long suffering supporter of one successful football club. Hamburg Sport Women with these words and introducing his topic, which is reimagining international courts, reflections on the century of international adjudication. I invite Professor Tams to take the floor. Professor, the floor is all yours. Many thanks, many thanks, uh, Anki, for this uh, kind and uh, instructive introduction. Many thanks to the organizers. It's a pleasure and a privilege to speak to you. To, uh, uh, to speak at Jindal Global University. I appreciate the invitation of the Jindal Society for International Law and of course the work of the Center for the Study of the United Nations. It's good to be in inverted commas back to Jindal. I have very fond memories of a talk properly given at Jindal in pre-COVID times in 2017. And of course I have great respect for the work carried out by colleagues at that institution which looking at it from Scotland, is a beacon of scholarship for international legal research in India. I would like to mention, simply by anecdotal evidence, my close colleague Prabhaka Singh, uh, and a former student of ours at Glasgow, who's now an assistant professor at Jindal Global Law School, uh, 
Devolina Basupat, uh, who was a wonderful student at Glasgow and now is uh, back to Jindal. Um, I appreciate um, the uh, guidance that the study for international law gets from the Vice Dean of Jindal uh, Law Faculty, Basil uh, Popovsky. And of course, I appreciate in particular the kind invitation, Ankit Malhotra, by you and the work you're doing for the study and sponsoring of international legal research at your institution. So it's really, that is the setting, uh, an enjoyable uh, presence uh, made only slightly affected by the fact that it is on Zoom and not in a real encounter. But nevertheless, so the topic has been introduced. Um, a century of international adjudication. It's a broad topic. Um, it's reflections on a century of international adjudication and reflections on the role of courts as we're approaching the second century of international adjudication. I will unpack those terms shortly in the course of my discussions, but let me start with a call for action, a quote from 1921, which is dramatic in tone, and even if in my oratory I will not be able to match it, I hope you will get some of the sense of the urgency in forming it. So here's the quote. We should fall upon our knees and thank God that the hope of ages is in the process of realization. End of quote. That is what James Brown Scott, one of the most prominent international lawyers uh, of the early 20th century, wrote exactly 100 years ago in the pages of the American Journal of International Law of 1921. Now, James Brown Scott was given to enthusiasm. His writing was flowery and has an old fashioned charming touch to it. It's miles away from the technical legalese that informs most of our writing today. But a century ago, James Brown Scott felt that he had reason to be enthusiastic. What was, in his words, in the process of realization was his lifetime project, an international court that would administer justice among nations um, in a process of international adjudication. A permanent court of international justice would be created, a world court. Now, I do not propose that we fall on our knees collectively now, but let me use uh, James Brown Scott's quote as a benchmark and assess where we stand one century later and how we got there. What has become of the hope of ages that he referred to 100 years ago, that 100 years ago was in the process of realization? And guided by that question, I will offer reflections on a century of international adjudication. As we have a lot to cover, a century, no less, let me jump right in. In the next 50 minutes or so, I will do three things. I will first take us back in time a century and revisit the world court's moment of creation when the hope of ages was being realized. I will second you take uh, I will second take us and take you on a journey through time and identify what I consider to be significant developments in our approach to international courts and international adjudication. What has changed since 1921 when the Permanent Court of International Justice was set up? That's my second part of this lecture. And third, in light of these discussions, I will then in the third and probably somewhat shortest uh, part of the lecture sketch out ideas for how we might want to reimagine international courts as we approach the second century of international adjudication. Um, and that will conclude my discussion or my lecture, and I hope then we can discuss this a bit further. Now, before I begin, let me state the obvious, I will be not comprehensive. We're looking at a century and beyond, so of course I will be at best impressionistic in my treatment, um, offer sketches and broad brushstrokes, but perhaps ca that can be useful because so much of the scholarship on international courts and tribunals is quite technical, granular, and detailed. So I don't think you'll get that in the next 50 minutes. So first then, back 100 years, rewind to 1921. India is in the middle of the non-cooperation movement. Future Prime Minister P.V. Narasimha Rao is born. In China, the Communist Party is being established. But our scene is mostly set in Europe, 
because while we're talking about a world court that is being set up, it is a pretty Eurocentric approach to it with some American, North American input. So in Europe, European states are still recovering from the First World War, 1914 to 1918, and the post-world order is taking shape. US President Woodrow Wilson, who was the key guide in setting this up, uh, had claimed in 1918 that the post-world order must be a new world order, one that leaves behind the cabals of European alliances and balance of power thinking. The League of Nations from 1919, 1920 onwards became the main focus of that new world order thinking. But the topic of our discussion today, the World Court, uh, is part of the League of Nations projects, even if indirectly linked to it. Article 14 of the founding document of the League of Nations, the covenant of the League of Nations, called upon the League Council to work out plans for a permanent court that would have advisory and contentious jurisdiction to settle disputes and other matters. And the Council notes Shabtai Rosen, the foremost commentator on the International Court, the Council quickly got down to work. In early 1920, it sets up an advisory committee. In mid-1920, that committee produces a report which is the template for the establishment of the permanent court. The Council looks at this report and modifies it in important respects, then puts it before the assembly of the League of Nations, the plenary body. On 13th of December 1920, the statute of the Permanent Court of International Justice is adopted. Three quarters of a year later, almost a century ago, it enters into force. And a further month later, the first judges are being elected. In early 1922, the court is inaugurated. So this is really century territory. It's happened exactly a century ago. One century ago, the first world court was established. And if we're looking at the sequence of the events, 1922, early 1922, a process lasting one and a half years, then we see that this was institution building at breakneck speed. It takes a lot longer today to set up judicial institutions. But speed was not everything. What excited James Brown Scott to the point where he wanted us all to fall down on, on our knees and thank God was the fact that a court was established at all, because this had been um, the hope of ages, the hope of many since at least um, for centuries. The idea that there would be an international court to guard world peace. The idea can be traced back millennia almost, but it found expression in a, in a famous quote by Jeremy Bentham, uh, who in his work on the universal and perpetual plea, peace had claimed this, and I quote or paraphrase, if you establish a common tribunal, the necessity for war no longer follows from difference of opinion. The decisions of the arbiters will save the credit, the honor of the contending party, end of quote. Courts and tribunals were peacemakers. That was the hope of ages. And in the 19th century, this vision of peace through adjudication, peace through arbitration gained significant momentum, mostly in Europe and North America, but also to some extent in Latin America. International arbitration picked up. Claims commissions, the Alabama claims, big cases were being decided for the first time by arbitral tribunals. And perhaps more importantly for our topic, international adjudication and arbitration dominated the visions of those thinking about future world orders, from pacifists to um, communists and socialists, to religious people, to US secretaries of state, to the early generation of international law scholars. Much of the internationally minded elite rallied around Bentham's idea that arbitration or adjudication would bring peace to the world. By 1914, six years before the establishment of the PCIJ, the First World Court began in earnest, um, we have a well-established arbitration campaign. Mark Mazauer, in his um, important book on ruling the world or governing the world, noted that this was probably the single most influential strand of internationalism. Pacifist conferences were optimistic. They noted that 
with almost scientific confidence that it had now been established that arbitration could be a substitute for war. And arbitration was central and international adjudication was central to the two Hague Peace Conferences, which in 1899 and 1907 marked milestones in this, the quest for international government, governments. Um, overall, we can see that in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, there was a widespread belief in the power of international courts and in particular in that power to bring peace to the world. Now, this explains why James Brown Scott was so excited, where others had dreamed or believed or schemed, the League acted. A world court was set up within one and a half years. No wonder people were enthusiastic. And the League Secretary General, Sir Eric Drummond of Scottish origins, and not one who normally was the one for the flowery rhetoric, uh, he noted at the opening that the world court would probably prove and I quote, the greatest landmark in the history of mankind. After all, he continued to say, the ideal to which I presume all men of goodwill look forward is that not only individual nations, but the whole world shall be ruled by law. Now, those statements are pretty big stuff. The hope of ages, the rule of law, one court to rule them all. Even if we accept the need to be flowery and grandstanding and opening ceremonies, this is putting it quite high. So it's important to also see the other side of a century ago. Not everybody agreed with those positive assessments of James Brown Scott and Drummond. Where they saw a breakthrough, others saw a missed opportunity. The World Court, in their view, was miles away from the real hope of ages. It was a watered down version that deserved no loud cheering. The second perspective on the founding moment of international adjudication is crucial too, even though we're unlikely to hear it repeated in the centenary uh, celebrations that are being prepared. In the second perspective, the limitations of the new court are all too obvious. I mentioned two of them. The first is straightforward. What was set up was a world court whose jurisdiction was based on consent, double consent, in fact, because states had to accept its statute and confer upon the new court jurisdiction to deal with particular disputes. And unlike in 1907 at the Hague Peace Conferences, there was no dramatic debate about the matter. The advisory committee of jurists that I mentioned proposed that a court would have automatic jurisdiction. But the Council of the League fairly unceremoniously shot down this proposal. States could, of course, vest the court with jurisdiction and in a generalized manner, and they did so frequently. This was the system devised under the optional clause of jurisdiction under Article 36 of the Statute of the PCIJ, which finds uh, an almost exact equivalent in Article 36, Paragraph 2 of the Statute of the current ICJ. But that optional clause was, well, optional, not mandatory. And so the idea or the era of international courts began on a decidedly consensualist note. And there's a second reason why others were not quite as excited as James Brown Scott uh, or, um, uh, or, or others in looking at this new international court. In the new post-World War order, the permanent court was set up, a court was there, but it seemed designed even from the beginning to play a relatively marginal role. It operated on the sidelines of the new international system that was established with the League at its heart. Now, in the 19th century, in the early 20th century, many pacifists and legalists had organized their proposals for a new world order around an international court that took center stage. At the Hague conferences, international arbitration was seen as the method of preventing war. Courts were war prevention tools, in the words of Yuval Shani. And going to court was meant to be a substitute for war. Now, by 1919, things had changed markedly when the leaders of the Allied and the Associated Powers began to design the new world order for the, after, for the time after the World War, 
They did not see the court as a central guardian of peace. The founders of the League of Nations were idealists in their own way, but theirs was not the idealism of the legalists. It did not center on arbitration or adjudication, but on collective decision-making within international organizations. Not the force of law administered by impartial courts was to ensure peace, but the strength of political action backed by public opinion. Woodrow Wilson, to quote again Mark Mazower, Woodrow Wilson was impatient with the entire legalist paradigm. Now we keep hearing how the league was legalist, and that may be true in some respect, but as far as collective security was concerned, the covenant placed trust in a political process. Courts were useful, but the League Council was at the heart of the peace machinery in a way that today's institutional machinery of the United Nations is built around, for better or worse, the Security Council. Now, to be clear, the problems of that approach of relying on a council um, with elite membership structures of a small group of powerful states became apparent early on in the League era, and they continue to haunt us to this day. The International Society has yet to find an efficient and effective way of organizing collective decision making on matters of global conflict. But in that quest, it seems to me that we're looking at institutional approaches first and foremost. Um, we see a switch a century ago from a blueprint that placed courts at the heart of the machinery to a new template begun with the League that relied primarily on councils of small groups of states that make decisions on behalf of the international community. And that didn't escape other commentators. As I said, not everybody was as excited and uh, optimistic as James Brown Scott. So here's a quote from Elihu Root, um, the founder of the American Society of International Law, former US Secretary of State, the godfather in many ways of legalism. He did not like at all what he saw. So this is what he said when looking at the proposals for the covenant and the role or limited role that it envisaged for international courts. Nothing has been done, he said, to provide for the reestablishment and strengthening of a system of arbitration or judicial decision. We are left with a program that rests the hope of the whole world for future peace in a government of men and not of laws, following the dictates of expediency and not of right, end of quote. So these are the two perspectives reflected by the two, if you want, torchbearers of US legalism in the early 20th century. James Brown Scott, enthusiastic, Aliu Root, a lot more cautious. Each of them had a point. The world would now have its world court eventually. That's James Brown Scott's enthusiasm. But that world court was unlikely to be, become a war prevention tool in the way earlier generations of pacifists and legalists had hoped a court would become. The century of adjudication had begun with a new court, but gave that court a relatively modest brief, restrained by an insistence on consensualism and restrained also by its situating it on the margins of the global peace machinery or institutional peace machinery that was being established. So that's the starting point. That's what happened a century ago. Uh, that also, I think, highlights why it's worth reflecting back on what happened a century ago, because while these developments are 100 years uh, over, they do shape our approach to international adjudication in many ways. And that brings me to the second part of my talk in which I will do something entirely different, not look at the history from 100 years ago, but look at how things have developed since then. Now, this is not a journey through time that I'm proposing to take you to in any classical or chronological sense, where we look at sort of decade by decade, the fate of international adjudication. Rather, what I propose to do is to do it slightly differently. And if you want the reverse, I suggest that we look back now at that century from 2021, Glasgow, Delhi, um, where we're currently based. We're looking back over a century of adjudication using the privilege of hindsight to understand and highlight where we have come, how we have come here and what has changed. Now to do this, I will shift away from the small sketches and historical accounts to a very broad brushstroke approach. 
and I'll outline five points that, in my view, capture the central developments in international adjudication over the course of that century. Brush strokes offered, of course, with the benefit of hindsight, and of course, even more so, without attempting to be very detailed. Brush strokes are not that. They are not finer points of detail. So I think there are five of such uh, key developments that are worth noting, and I'll put them in buzzwords now, um, and then I'll work uh, my way, our way through them. The first is we have rank growth in the use of international courts and expansion and diversification. The second is international adjudication since 1921 in its first century has embraced the mundane areas of international law. It has moved from war prevention to stopping zeroing and to dealing with technical questions. That's the second point. The third buzzword is the loss of innocence. In the century, in the first century of its existence, international adjudication has begun to face legitimacy problems that in 1921 were not foreseeable. The fourth point, falling in line, international courts are now increasingly seen as political actors within treaty regimes and have to be seen as such. And fifthly, beyond disputes, international courts today perform diverse functions that the founders of the movement a century ago did not foresee. So these are five points. I'll deal with each of them relatively briefly, but I think you can probably sense from the listing that it's a broad, uh, a broad canvas that I'm trying to cover. So forgive my brushstroke approach to things. Um, the first point, rank growth in international adjudication, expansion and diversification. That's the first, and in some ways, the most straightforward point. So in a nutshell, it's this. Since 1922, when the World Court, the Permanent Court of International Justice, was inaugurated, we've never had no court. The idea of an international court has proved resilient throughout the ups and downs of 20th century and 21st century legal history or diplomatic history. And perhaps we can say more and say that this has been a massive success, the idea of an international court. Um, when the UN took over from the League of Nations, it preserved the Permanent Court of International Justice. It renamed it, calling it International Court of Justice, and changed tweaks and uh, made tweaks and changes here or there. But in essence, it preserved the existing structure. Since 1960, the number of courts has increased, first modestly and then significantly. Um, in a process, in the process, the concept. Um, of an international court has been diversified. We have seen a move towards regional international courts, notably in the fields of human rights and regional economic integration. Um, we have the African Court and Commission of Human Rights, we have the Inter-American Court, we have European courts, we have regional integration communities with their courts in all continents. At the global level, we've seen a movement towards specialization. Specialization, a specialized courts and tribunals have appeared. Um, the WTO panels and appellate body, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea uh, and others. Um, since the 1990s, the global fight against impunity has been pursued via international criminal courts. Um, while we have, while the PCIJ, the Permanent Court was the first global international court, Depending on how you count, we now have approximately 40 of such institutions. That's up from one a century ago and from five or six, depending on how you count, uh, 50 years ago. And we've also seen a blurring of lines between international adjudication and arbitration. At the time, a century ago, this seemed a massively important distinction. Today, I think we're more pragmatic. Arbitration and adjudication may not be, as the British international lawyer Ian Brownlee observed, um, essentially the same, but I would say they have a lot more in common than between them. Um, so which suggests that if we want a full picture of international courts and tribunals operating today, we might also need to include the significant rise of international arbitration frameworks, whether that is at the interstate fields, notably under Article uh, under UNCLOS Annex 7, 
or in the controversial field of investment arbitration. So to conclude on this first and relatively straightforward point, the idea of international adjudication of international courts and tribunals has been a massive success. What was exceptional and noteworthy 100 years ago is now routine business to the point where people 20 years ago were thinking that going to court was now the new norm, that there was a new compulsory paradigm. That may have been hubristic, but uh, what we can certainly say is um, international litigation before international courts and tribunals is now in certain fields routine business. In that sense, there has been rank growth of institutions and an explosion of the activity that they deal with, namely international litigation. My second point, related but separate, embracing the mundane from no more war to stopping zeroing. Not everything is quite so rosy. Yes, the number of courts has increased, but if we look back at the issues that these courts are dealing with, and it seems to me that growth has primarily come from areas of international law that a century ago may not have been considered all that relevant and that perhaps even today are not so relevant in the larger scheme of things. I don't want to overstate the point, um, nor claim that it's surprising, but it's worth noting, lest we lose perspective. The development since 1922, notwithstanding the massive growth of fora, has not really brought the international legal system much closer to the vision of 19th century legalists. Arbitration and adjudication at the international level are many things, but hardly ever a substitute for war. In this respect, the decision taken in 1990 remains true for today. Questions of war and peace are not primarily viewed as problems of litigation. Stephen Schwebel, former judge of the United States or of US national former judge of the International Court of Justice, uh, put things relatively bluntly in an article. He said, the hope of the peace movement of the late 19th and early 20th centuries, that international adjudication was the substitute for war, was ill-founded and, and unduly idealistic. Now, that was said a few decades ago. Since then, things have changed, and international courts do play today discrete roles in relation to military conflicts by adjudicating on narrowly defined aspects of conflict, Think of claims commissions established after war, think of uh, criminal responsibility uh, imposed after conflict on individuals. Um, occasionally also they get involved in deciding disputes on the basis of compromissory clauses that are related to a major conflict. There's some India-Pakistan experience in that respect, and there are currently many cases before regional and international global courts that oppose, for example, Georgia and Russia or Ukraine and Russia, which have their source, their underlying source in a global conflict. But overall, as peace and security narrowly defined are concerned, very few today would vest their key hopes in international courts as bringers of peace. They have been transformed in Yuval Shani's phrase from war prevention tools to providers of preventative treatment. And rather than from questions of war and peace, the growth of adjudication has been driven by developments elsewhere, from human rights law, where at least on the regional level, hundreds of millions of citizens are permitted to litigate dramatic and mundane questions before regional courts, from regional economic integration organizations, which have found it useful to establish courts um, as institutions that make transboundary economic dealings stable and predictable, and from the uh, establishment of dispute resolution systems and highly sophisticated and technical areas such as cross-border trade and investment. The silly title that I've chosen for my second brush stroke, huh, from war prevention to regulating zeroing, points to one such technical area. Um, through a series of cases, WTO jurisprudence has progressively narrowed down the room for zeroing, a particular technique in anti-dumping law. There are significant jurisprudence on this. How do you measure this? What is it? How does it relate to anti-dumping subsidies? Which is a contribution of sorts, but not the one that James Brown Scott, Elihu Root, or others had in mind when they first thought about the establishment of an international court. Uh, international education, a century on, certainly reflects international law's pedestrian and mundane as much as its 
dramatic aspects. This is not a bad thing, but it marks a shift in the role of international courts. And cynics might, of course, say that the move towards the technical area has enabled the growth because it is much easier for states to accept routine adjudication on technical aspects than on sensitive, dramatic matters of high political sensitivity. So here we are, rank growth and an embracing of the mundane aspects of international legal life. These are my two first points. My third point, um, the loss of innocence, legitim legitimacy problems facing international courts. It seems to me that as it has grown and expanded, international adjudication has lost some of its innocence, perhaps even some of its aura. That was bound to happen. It always is the case if matters become routine, they lose their aura. But it's, and it, sorry, it, it was bound to happen. And perhaps we could also say that rather than a loss of an aura, it is a fact of us becoming more realistic, becoming less naive in thinking about international courts and tribunals. That loss of innocence, that shedding of naivety has been a gradual process. And it seems to me that if we're looking at law professors or statesmen or stateswomen speaking about international courts, quite a lot of that naivety still remains. And I'll come back to that towards the end of my talk when reimagining how things might develop. But still, I think for now, I would say the days in which one could think of an international court as an august body of wise and in the Eurocentric time, almost inevitably white men um, sitting, um, sort of providing their wisdom to solve an intractable conflict, that looks a bit very old fashioned. Those days are over. There are different aspects to it. And overall, it's probably a good thing, a healthy development. But the process of shedding naivety has been marked by difficult awakenings. Uh, students of the ICJ or experts on the ICJ may think of the Southwest Africa case. The ICJ rejecting a, a claim brought by Ethiopia and Liberia scrutinizing the conduct of South Africa in the Mandate territory of Namibia, where it was imposing segregationist policies. The ICJ rejected those claims on narrow procedural grounds. And so this was perceived by, by very many, including in the country I'm speaking from, including in the country where you're listening to me, as a world court standing in the way of world justice, not bringing world justice about and hiding behind legal formalities. In the international criminal field, you might think of the Gotovina saga. Um, we don't really know enough, but there are stories of bullying within an international court, curious three to two reversal decisions. Um, nobody quite knows, but there's a lot of bitter feelings about how uh, Mr. Gotovina was first of all tried and then, uh, then acquitted. Think of the arbitration between Croatia and Slovenia in which the arbitrator appointed by one party was in contact unduly with the agent of that same party. Uh, a blog post referred to it as the leaks, the wiretaps and the scandal of that arbitration. Later attempts to save face by the tribunal have not really put the process back on track. This was an interstate arbitration which was marred by improper behavior of at least one of the parties and ruins any perception that international arbitration is per se and inevitably an august good thing. Think finally of the Achilles heel of current legitimacy debates, investment arbitration, um, where we're discussing about many of the problems of the arbitral process, repeat appointments, bias, revolving doors of arbitrators sitting uh, in cases and then appearing as counsel before arbitral tribunals, um, ghost written awards, Lots of concerns going to the process, not just the substance of the law. Um, not a model way of running an arbitration system. Most international lawyers probably remain convinced that in general, international adjudication can be a force for good and deserves to be nurtured. But having followed it over a century, we are a bit wiser, I think. We appreciate that it's not all quite the august um, uh, method of settling conflicts, or not always. And this is what I mean with my third point, 
uh, international courts and international adjudication have lost over the course of the last century some of their innocence. I make two more points, um, but uh, in the interest of time, I will slightly speed up so that we have an opportunity to also discuss where the future might take us and where the reimagining might take us. So my fourth and fifth point, um, I'll put them together. Uh, and they are, I think, in an am amalgamated form, they are this. International courts do not stand apart. It's clear to us now, looking back, that they are actors within regimes of international law. Um, and we do not fully appreciate their role in contemporary international society if we, if we see them solely as di dispute settlers. They perform many more functions. Now, these two points reflect changes in the ways international courts function. And again, the contrast in 1921 is striking. When the first world court was set up, it was set up as a court of potential general jurisdiction. It could deal with all types of conflicts and disputes from boundary disputes to questions of minorities, to concessions, to any breach of international law. Nothing was beyond its scope, ratione materie, but of course the parties needed to provide the court with consent. So jurisdiction was broad, but shallow. The World Court in 1922 was set up as a separate body, separate from any substantive treaty regime. Um, it could deal with any matter, but the substantive issues would come from another treaty or from another body of law. Um, this made, and it continues to make for the ICJ, which has preserved the structure for a curious portfolio of disputes. Over a century of international adjudication, the World Court, PCIJ and ICIJ, uh, ICJ, has addressed the most diverse aspects of international law. But of course, it lacks a home turf. Cases cluster in particular areas, responsibility, law of treaties, boundary disputes. But precisely because it can, in principle, deal with everything, the World Court's contribution, and I'm saying this without disrespect, my respect could not be greater, but the World Court's contribution to international law is a bit all over the place. Now, contrast this to the newer courts, or the majority of the newer courts. Their mandates tend to be a lot more focused. WTO panels deal with WTO law, and in principle, nothing else. Investment tribunals inevitably interpret BITs and investment contracts. ITLOS deals with the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and so do arbitral tribunals established under that convention. The Inter-American Court of Human Rights looks at the Inter-American Convention on Human Rights, and so on and so forth. International courts today tend to be specialized or specialized and regional. And this specialization has meant two things. First of all, their impact is a lot narrower. You will have no equivalent to a century of judgments by the International Court of Justice and the PCIJ covering pretty much every area of international law. But it is a lot more focused. These specialized tribunals have their home turf. And this has, I would say, shaped their role and this makes for a different role than the one envisaged for the PCIJ in 1922. These new courts are not necessarily generalist in outlook. They are guardians of a particular regime and almost inevitably of a particular treaty. And where they have many cases, through their jurisprudence, they effectively control that treaty. To give you two examples, uh, one is from my own region, Europe. Um, the European Court of Human Rights, the European Human Rights Court set in Strasbourg, deals with thousands of cases per year. They all, in one way or the other, turn on the interpretation of the fundamental rights and freedoms granted by that European Human Rights Convention. What does right to life mean? What does a right to a remedy mean? What does fair trial mean? What does, uh, what does freedom of assembly mean? How are those rights to be balanced against demands in an, to regulate an international, in a national society? If we want to understand how human rights in Europe are construed, we cannot ignore the ECHR jurisprudence. Its judgments are crucial to understanding what these rights mean in practice. And adapting a famous saying about the US Constitution, I think we can say the European Court of Human, uh, the European Convention on Human Rights is what the judges in Strasbourg say it is. <laughs> 
And perhaps something similar, this is my second example, could be said about investment arbitration. Investment arbitration is curious. It's based on bilateral treaties. And they have very general clauses. The general clauses tend to be the same. Protection against expropriation, protection of fair and equitable treatment, most favored nation standard. In and, by, in and of themselves, as a matter of textual analysis, they say very little. If we want to understand what investment protection means, we need to look to the arbitral jurisprudence on the construction of the fair and equitable treatment standard, on indirect expropriation, and so on and so forth. Again, jurisprudence is almost controlling because these tribunals have their home turf. They do nothing but interpret a narrow set of treaty provisions. My fourth and fifth point flow from this, even if I've now just sketched this out. It seems to me that if we look at international courts today, we see most of them as guardians of a particular treaty regime, integrated into that regime and functioning within it, subject to the pressures of that regime. WTO law works with committees, with councils, and with uh, adjudicative bodies. The ICC has COPs and meetings of parties to deal with. Um, human rights work within a European or inter-American human rights architecture. We need to view them if we want to appreciate their roles as actors within those treaty regimes. And these treaty regimes, unlike with the PCIJ and ICJ, lay down both the substantive rules and provide for mechanisms for implementation and enforcement. So the decisions and the impact of decisions of international courts, in my view, are not properly captured if we see courts only as dispute settlers. Of course, they decide cases and thereby hopefully settle disputes and administer justice. But the newer courts have functions that go well beyond that. They clarify and develop the law, perhaps even control it, as my European Court of Human Rights example suggests. They can be seen as political actors in a system of governance, <clears throat> e.g., for example, in many regional trade integration institutions. The role is often symbolically highly relevant, as with the International Criminal Court, where the opening of an investigation is a signal. And often proceedings before international courts and tribunals are being used, some would say abused, to raise awareness for otherwise forgotten disputes or as part of a strategy of legal public diplomacy. This complicates the role of international courts, but it also adds to their relevance. So this concludes the second part of my overview of changes uh, in the last century. This has been reasonably high level, but we've surveyed a century, no less. So as I said, these are brush strokes, not fine nuances. But the brush strokes, to repeat them again, because I think this is what I want to build on as I look ahead, are the following. First of all, rank growth. The number of international courts has massively increased. Secondly, embracing the mundane aspects of international law. It's not a matter of war and peace or substituting for war. It's also a matter of adjudicating on pretty technical, pedestrian, sometimes very boring aspects of international law. These issues make up for the mass of international litigation. Um, thirdly, the loss of innocence. In a century of adjudication, we've seen some of the darker sides at play. It's not all good and august. And fourth and fifth, in an amalgamated way, we need to view international courts and tribunals as political actors, typically now part of treaty regimes, which settle disputes, but do a lot more than that. Now, um, this then is a relatively complex picture, even if it's just sketched out. Um, but it also, of course, means that international courts and tribunals are a pretty diverse group. And this makes it somewhat challenging to see uh, to, to think about a re-imagination of how they could perform in the future. But let me try. And so in concluding, in by far the significantly shortest part of my presentation, let me offer three encouragements, suggestions, for how we as academics, as observers, as practitioners, as users of international courts, might view these international courts in their second century of international adjudication. These encouragements and suggestions are general in nature, uh, but I hope, uh, I hope they open up ways of rethinking uh, 
international courts and tribunals. In a nutshell, they are this. The first suggestion is for academic lawyers. It's perhaps more an internal point to my colleagues in law and to students in law. Recognize and embrace political perspectives on international courts and tribunals. Don't stay with the legal analysis. The second point, perhaps addressed to those giving speeches, praising the importance of international courts, perhaps tone down, scale down the rhetoric a bit. Recognize the shifts brought about in a century of international education as we prepare for the second such century. And thirdly, for all of us, uh, let us use international courts strategically to advance projects we pursue in which they can help, in which they can be important tools. Three points then, a word each or three words each about, uh, uh, about them. The first, as I said, is more an internal point, aimed at my colleagues in law, perhaps also at me, and also at our students. I'm making it because it seems to me, looking at the literature, literature in law, in international law, we are a bit stuck with our legal approaches to international courts. I don't want for a moment for us to ignore them, I just want them to be complemented by alternative approaches. If we look at textbooks, we find adjudication discussed in the international law textbooks typically as part of the dispute settlement chapters. So we hear about diplomatic and judicial means and binding means of dispute settlement. And then at some point, almost like the crowning achievement, comes a section on international adjudication and the international court. If we look at the writing on international courts, we see a dominance of case note writing, working out in detail what a particular judgment meant in a particular context, how it's to be interpreted. And there's especially in the sophisticated regimes of adjudication, WTO, human rights, a massive body of expert literature. And none of this is bad, and none of this should stop. But I think what I would <clears throat> suggest is as we approach the second century is for us to be clearer as legal scholars and students of law that this is only part of the picture. As lawyers, we see courts as our natural habitat. That's how we think of settling disputes. But be perhaps because we put them in that box, it seems to be we neglect, or many of us neglect, to view them as political actors. And I'm finding that uh, myself, when discussing the role of international courts with colleagues from outside law, that often my colleagues remain puzzled at our obsession with an intricate detail. And I struggle to explain to my colleagues from outside law points that to them seem essential. What does it do to a dispute if it's brought before a court? What does it do for Ukraine if it raises a case against Russia before the International Court of Justice? This will not stop the war. This is not a question of settling that particular dispute. It's perhaps a question of raising awareness for a matter. What I'm being asked by my colleagues, what can we do of strategic litigation in human rights courts? What can you advise? And I feel that my legal skills have not been tested in that sense. I can spell out the meaning of a court judgment, I can write a case note, I can work out the, the importance of jurisdiction, of jurisdictional strictures, and all this is relevant. But it seems to me the legal analysis, the legal scholarship in many ways has not really caught up with that shift that I've tried to outline, the recognition that we must see courts, international courts, as political actors working within regimes. So the first suggestion as we approach as international lawyers, the second century of international adjudication is to slightly step out of our legal method comfort zone and recognize that we can usefully speak and perhaps even more usefully speak about international courts if we use the vocabulary, uh, the notions, the concepts, uh, the categories shaped in political sciences and international relations. To reiterate, that is not to give up on our core skills uh, which we must hone and preserve, but to complement them. So that's the first point, as I said, an internal point. My second point is addressed to a separate, or my second suggestion is addressed to a different type of audience. Uh, tone down the rhetorics would be my um, flippant way of putting it. It's perhaps more directed at stateswomen and statesmen praising international courts and the language that uh, is reminiscent of James Brown Scott and his idea that we should fall on our knees because the hope of ages is in the process of being created. We see that reiterated surprisingly often. 
prays for international courts as central agents of international of the international rule of law, bringers of peace even. If you read statements in the international criminal court movement, uh, you see it. If you read statements about the 75th anniversary of the International Court of Justice, we see it repeated. And again, this is not wrong. Uh, and I am a fan of international courts. I wouldn't say a negative word about them. But it seems to me that a century of international education should have made us a bit more cautious. It's not 1921. We approach the second century of international education with a wealth of experience. Much of that experience is um, empowering. International courts can be used for good ends, and I'll come back to speak to that in a minute. But there's also a limitation. I think we need to come to terms with the fact that a century onwards, international courts are not primarily war prevention tools, to use that again, that they play a relatively limited role in great matters of global conflict, that we will not necessarily strengthen them if we raise the expectation all too high, and that we will not win if we, cons if we, that we will not win if we preserve that image of an august judiciary that can do no wrong. I think we need to embrace the limits of international courts and tribunals, speak openly about the failings of, in the administration of international justice, draw consequences from that, and be stricter where these failings are apparent, whether that's in international investment arbitration, in international arbitration, and not preserve dispute settlement processes because as a matter of principle, they are such a good thing. Um, there's a certain tendency to not speak about the dark sides, and I think that's harmful, and as we approach as observers of international courts or as political actors shaping uh, adjudication processes, as we observe the second century of international adjudication, I think there's an argument for more transparency, more owning of mistakes and failures. My third point, uh, because I don't want to end on an all too negative note. My third point is that as we approach the second century, uh, we should also play to the strengths and be strategic in using international courts for um, for the betterment of international society. Use them strategically. Um, I've spoken a lot and perhaps too much for an overview lecture about the limits. And I've spoken about how international courts have been in some ways marginalized in some ways. But of course, they do play a role. And the growth in number, the history of a century of adjudication, the experience gained through that provides us with lots of insights into how courts can be used to to make important, to provide an important input into um, the betterment of international society. This requires an engagement with strategic thinking, which is perhaps, I mean, we need to sort of engage with that and be strategic about the use of courts, but it can be done. And let me just, rather than uh, reflecting on in the abstract, give you a few examples. I've mentioned the Southwest Africa case, which is, a, if you want, a, an example of the International Court of Justice being used or where, where courts, uh, where court did not perform, did not, was not up to the expectations uh, of international society. I think we have lots of counter examples to that. To just give one example that's being mooted now, there's talk about uh, an advisory opinion being sought from the International Court of Justice to strengthen the international efforts to mitigate climate change. Now, this one court case won't solve the world. It won't solve the problems. But I think it can play a useful role in hardening, in strengthening, in standardizing, in streamlining the importance of climate change mitigation measures and can therefore do meaningful good uh, if it can help also bring climate change litigation out of the niche of those who pursue it and have been pursuing it for decades. If the International Court of Justice pronounces uh, on the importance of climate change, recognizes the significance of that, this can be an important imprimatur. Um, it can add to an ongoing struggle, which cannot be reduced to going to an international court. But I do think a, a voice, a word from the International Court of Justice would be a meaningful addition to other struggles uh, to mitigate the damages and losses incurred through climate change. This is just one example. There are many more such examples. Uh, and I've mentioned uh, in passing some of the current cases that are being brought to courts where on the fringes of a major conflict, uh, states bring a matter to the court, not in the hope that by winning a court case, they will 
win a war. Ukraine doesn't go to the International Court of Justice because it thinks if Russia loses the case, it will cede Crimea again that was annexed in 2014. But it brings the case in a shrewd strategic move, thinking that bringing the case will force Russia to make legal arguments, perhaps allow the world to assess the strength of these legal arguments, and it will bring the case in order to have visibility and um, information and interest in the case because it is being litigated and does so even though the court case will not solve the underlying dispute. These are examples of strategic uses of international courts which have become more prominent in the last few decades, which I think, are, I mean, which come with risks, but which I think are a positive um, aspect of recent developments and which I would want us to pursue and embrace as we look at the second century of international adjudication. Now, those are my three suggestions then. Um, embrace courts as political actors, um, tone down the rhetoric slightly, a bit less holy, and be strategic in using international courts for the betterment of society. These are, I think, three ways in which I would hope we can approach the second century of international adjudication and make good use of international courts. We do not, in concluding, need to fall on our knees we do not need to thank God that the hope of ages in the process of realization. We can rest assured in the certainty that international courts are there. They are there in plentiful number. They are constantly seized for disputes and they can be used better for the advancement of society. Many thanks for your attention. I look forward to your question. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Christian Thames. It's a, a wonderful... Uh, voyage throughout the history of international courts and tribunals but also a comprehensive coverage of what this uh, i will call it proliferation of international judicial bodies means today and i cannot agree more with your concluding suggestion that we cannot simply regard the international courts as we regard the domestic courts which have a very much traditional legal uh dispute resolution functions in international international law is uh, quite different and accordingly the international tribunals are quite different for that uh, matter what i would like also to say is that uh, in a sense uh, there were critiques against the so-called proliferation of international courts and tribunals who say that why do we need so many emerging all over and all over again. But I think it's more like the opposite argument. We do need a proliferation of international courts uh, because the international relations and the international law also develop in a very dynamic uh, way. The fact that we now do have international criminal court, we, before that we had ad hoc tribunals for Yugoslavia and Rwanda, we are talking about a new investment tribunal, possibly another international environmental tribunal to also adjudicate uh, disputes. I am not against that simply because that will make those courts more specific. Uh, again, somebody recommended the existent uh, ICC to take care of ecocide or environmental disasters. I don't think that approach will be a good one. It's better to have a separate international environmental tribunal specific and empowered to deal with uh, crimes, and these are crimes, but they need to be taken elsewhere, not in the International Criminal Court, uh, simply because genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes are, I think, fundamentally different from the environmental crimes and better to have that specificity and expertise uh, separately rather than to confuse the judges and the prosecutors and the legal scholars into the same tribunal. One tribunal cannot cover everything. And that was, as you pointed out very well historically also, the problem with the World Court, with the Permanent Court of Justice before, be, before the Second World War and the International Court of Justice after the Second World War. One good example of why do we need more tribunals rather than less tribunals is a famous Bankovic case, 
someone who lost her life during the NATO bombing in uh, Belgrade in Yugoslavia in 1999, during the bombing of the TV station, uh, one of the victims, her family, attempted to bring the case into the International Criminal Tribunal for Yugoslavia, but that was not successful. ICTY rejected to go into that, saying that this is not under the severity of the crimes that the ICTY was looking at. And the same uh, family, Bankovic, then went to the European Court of Human Rights and was successful by arguing that the NATO member of the European Convention of Human Rights did violate Article 2 of the Convention Right of Life. Uh, in the same way, we see how I will call it shy and modest was the ICJ uh, dealing with some uh, situation where the Security Council resolutions apparently went beyond the uh, scope of what the Security Council is expected to do. Remember the famous Lockerbie case in, back in 1990s and later Bosnia-Herzegovina genocide case, where attempts were made to challenge the decisions of the Security Council of going ultra virus, not successful in ICJ. But later in the European Court of Human Rights, CADI successfully challenged a resolution of the Security Council 1373 to impose a counter-terrorist regime, and in the annex of that uh, resolution, Cadi was listed as one of those potential supplier of uh, financing terrorism, uh, proved to be wrong. Uh, Cadi successfully defended himself, saying that his rights were violated under the European law because of the Security Council listing him and his company as a uh, uh, su supply of financing under the financing of terrorism uh, limitation. Uh, I will leave you in the hands of Ankit Malhotra now, who will moderate the remaining of the question and answer session. Uh, from me, uh, thank you very much, Christian, for being with us. We hope also to host you one day soon in, in Jindal University itself on campus. Uh, so Abi is also here, my co-instructor for the court uh, law and uh, practice of the United Nations, and he will also have some comments. From me, thank you, Christian Thames, and uh, have a good day. Thank you, Vesaline. That's been very uh, generous and kind, and I'm, I'm glad we're approaching this broadly from the same page. Uh, and as your as regards the presence in Jindal, of course, I would love to come back, as I was saying in the beginning. I mean, I have very fond memories of a previous visit, and I uh, have great respect, of course, for the scholarship produced by you and your colleagues and would love to visit. So let's hope, let's all keep our fingers crossed that the these present pandemic conditions will be left soon behind us so that we can begin to think of the nicer aspects or the nicer methods of interacting academically again. Many thanks for your comments. Professor Tams, I just had wanted to, first of all, thank you, Professor Popolsky, for your comments. Um, and Professor Tams, I just wanted to know your views on the approach towards international adjudication. For example, India as a country, as a dual approach. So if I refer to cases like Chagos or Marshall Islands, at one end, they support, uh, when they are not party to the case, they, they, uh, they, they basically support the court's judgments or they go towards, they subscribe to what the ICG has told. But when it comes to Marshall Islands case, where India is a party to the, uh, to the case, the, then they differ and they, argue then they argue for lack of jurisdiction so how, how do you suggest for a country in general and specifically india the approach towards international adjudication well thank you i mean uh, i think there's two things to distinguish one is the general approach of a country to vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular court and then the second is the more particular approach it takes in a in a particular dispute so i think in india's case the the ambivalence that you've outlined, I think is probably 
uh, reflected at both levels. I mean, you could say that at the first level, the general approach, one would look primarily at to what extent the state has uh, agreed to recognize the jurisdiction of that particular court, in this case, the, the ICJ. Um, and for that, India, of course, is, is famous for, its, uh, for bringing ambivalence to a higher level. And on the one hand, recognizing, um, making a sort of a unilateral declaration under the optional clause, under Article 36.2, in principle, recognizing the jurisdiction of the court over all disputes, which is the gold standard in some ways. But of course, something that around only a third of the states of the world have done. So India is part of that. And you might say that suggests a willingness to recognize the jurisdiction of the court to a significant extent. On the other hand, famously, this is from uh, the, uh, I think from most of my colleagues teaching dispute resolution in, in advanced courses is the Indian example of the reservations to that clause is probably also the most elaborate. So the number of issues that India has um, exempted from the general recognition of jurisdiction is, is very long and very comprehensive. So I think that perhaps speaks to the tension you have mentioned, even at the level of opening up to the jurisdiction of the International Court of Justice. Now, this is not wrong. This is not uh, problematic. This is perfectly legitimate and legal as a matter of law. But it shows, let's say, the nuances or the, the ambivalence in India's approach. As for the more immediate uh, cases, my sense is that um, it's, uh, I think, the, the, it depends a bit on how the jurisdictional picture plays out. I mean, states often um, make or well, dispute the jurisdiction of an international court in cases brought against them. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, I've often advised states in disputes where we felt, look, I mean, the jurisdictional title does not hold. You cannot uh, bring this case on the basis of the jurisdictional title that you have. And India has availed itself of that opportunity. Often, this is not a problem. Perhaps one could say it has been surprisingly successful, including in the Marshall Islands case, where perhaps the strategy was not necessarily going to win, but the ICJ was persuaded. So it's been surprisingly successful. Um, I think uh, there are limits to what can be said, what can be deduced from the general attitude um, towards individual cases. I think the most that can be expected from states, and it seems to me India is part of that group of states that meets these conditions or these requirements, is that they do not uh, in principle reject. They show themselves in principle open. And then they argue plausibly on the construction of jurisdictional titles. And it seems to me that while you're the expert on these matters much more than I am, it seems to me that the Indian conduct in the various India-Pakistan cases, the advisory proceedings that you've mentioned, um, reflects that. Uh, I think that's all I would say. I think the only other thing uh, I would say is that in addition to the more contentious cases, there are, of course, also then um, interesting uh, proceedings before uh, before the ICJ that we discussed. There are interesting experiences that India has gained in, in the more maritime matters, whether that's the boundary delimitation agreements with neighboring countries, uh, or whether that's the more, the far smaller, you might say, the far smaller issue, but, ten, but contentious issue of the Enrica Lexi incident opposing India and Italy. So I think the peculiar feature I find is that India's willingness to uh, engage in international dispute resolution has massively increased in the last 20 years compared to what it was before. And I think that is reflective of a general trend. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so I'll just pick up from there and make a couple of uh, points. But before I do that, let me just share uh, what Louis Henkin said on, on international law and adherence. He said, and I quote him, it is often observed that almost all nations, almost all of the time, observe almost all of the principles of international law. And I think it's really a state prerogative which determines adherence to the principles of international, international law. I'll make three more po points, sir, and then you can address them. And then we can close. First point which I would like to raise is that I have written a paper on the decorative objects inside the Peace Palace. The Peace Palace, as you might have seen in your experience, is a, is a mirage of different objects from different states. One of the objects in the Peace Palace is the Ramsel Cat. The Ramsel Cat, interestingly, was responsible to save the judges of the, I, of the PCIJ when there was a fire that almost destroyed the Peace Palace. 
I wrote this paper under the guidance of and uh, under the guidance of Professor Esther Schmidt, who's teaching the architecture school in our university. The other point which I want to raise is something which this lecture series has inspired me to think about. This is regional internationalism. Not only in negotiations of treaties, but also in other facets. Why is rather than one state representing its voice, why aren't organizations such as the ASEAN, such as the EU or, or Latin American states represented to give a more coherent view in terms of reaching a more personified, precise and sharp perspective. This is with the aim to adhere and improve the uh, responsibility towards international obligations. The Third point which I want to make is with respect to diversification. Now, when, when you said it, my mind went to diversification of persons, diversification of views. There is a view that exists that seeks to, 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 to contain an international mafia which dominates the roster, or at least the, 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 the bar of international lawyers which represents states at at the World Court and other such institutions. My perspective is that not inclusivity for the sake of inclusivity, which is to say that you just have persons from XYZ origins represented, but have views from persons who have, like your goods have, invested their life to a subject and come and represent, but also be more inclusive in terms of these views being more diverse, because the diversity of views will create as as is taught in an alternate dispute resolution, ZOPA, a zone of possible agreement of these diverse views. So that's how I understand diversification and how I seek to, to see it. Because after all, I would also like to represent states in these institutions. The last point is more like a, of, a, of, a, of a note of appreciation. Um, <clears throat> I, I've studied Winston Churchill's efforts towards the European Court of Human Rights, which you spoke about in, in, in your presentation, and the instrumental role that a statesman like him played in the creation of an international regime, which, spans the juris which extends the jurisdiction of, the, uh, 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 of its subjects to not only the EU states, but across other members to include 500 million people. I think efforts like those are instrumental but do we have the statesmen in this present generation to lead that? Those are the points which I wanted to raise, sir. Thank you, thank you, Ankit. These are, I mean, you spoke about diversity, but you've also raised diverse points. Let me see whether I can do them justice in responding, uh, stopping short of a two, two hour uh, extempore uh, response. Um, now, three points. I mean, one, let's start with a cat. Um, let's start with a cat, the cat and the peace palace and the design. I mean, this is, and I want to tie it back to one thing. That is perhaps something that also begins in a century ago. Uh, the, I mean, I spoke about courts as political actors, but perhaps that is even not the comprehensive perspective. We need to see, for example, the peace palace as a site. Um, it's a, an iconic building when it was inaugurated. Bertha von Suttner, uh, Austrian-Hungarian pacifist of the 19th century, but living into the 20th century, said um, humanity had for centuries and millennia built memorials to war, to war heroes, to triumphers, commemorating military disasters. And this was the first time the Peace Palace in 1913 inaugurated that humanity had built a monument to peace. I'm not sure that's an accurate reading of history, there might have been earlier monuments to peace, but I think the point stands um, that this is an impressive monument to peace and it's easy to make fun of the cat and the peace palace and the sort of the strange objects and all looks a bit stuffy, but it has, an, it has an impressive atmosphere. And whether that's the cat outside, which adds a, an element of flippancy, the story you know much better than I do, but this, the cat looks interesting and is a moment to have people connect with it, whether that's the interior design of the Japanese room or whether that's the sculpture of Mahatma Gandhi in the Peace Palace uh, buildings. We have, I, I regularly take students there um, uh, on, on excursions to the Hague, to the Peace Palace. And then we tend to follow discussions uh, 
in court cases. But I think what they leave with is far more the impression of the building, um, the building which is a shrine of international adjudication and arbitration. And so I think that is important. And so this is my more general reflection on the point you brought up. The Peace Palace is worth a visit. And I think there's come something that comes from the, the aura of the place. I've spoken about the loss of an aura of the process of adjudication, but I think the Peace Palace preserves much of that. The second point, diversification, the mafia, control over access to adjudication as a council. Um, and I think, I mean, look, this is something that is, that there's a tension here. On the one hand, adjudication and arbitration benefit from expertise, from trust, from experience. Um, and they are certainly for the um, appointment of, uh, of the functionaries, in particular the judges, very state controlled processes. Um, there's a lot of concern about the composition of, you spoke about Anki, the bar, but also then of course of the bench. I think what we're seeing now is a beginning of a discussion that in the composition of the bench, the International Court of Justice must reflect diversities in many ways. I mean, it does so through the proportional representation and election of judges based on the, U the usual, if you want, UN um, format of sort of assigning and allocating seats to regional groups. But this is no longer static. I mean, something that uh, the people in India will be intimately aware of is that at the last round of election, um, a British judge was running against an Indian judge. The Indian judge obtained the majority, even though this was a seat that had been allocated in one of these informal arrangements previously to a, a British judge, a British candidate. So there is movement there. And we've seen it again uh, last week with the election of a candidate from Australia who replaced a previously deceased uh, candidate, my doctoral supervisor, James Crawford, who is sorely missed. But there was a runoff, and it seemed to be a runoff not just between two states, but also between two, two visions of the international judge, a candidate, two qualified candidates, one with a, an impeccable human rights record on the European Court of Human Rights, the other um, an ad hoc judge who has inspired through her scholarship um, uh, international lawyers of a more critical vocation and a more skeptical vocation. Um, so I think these are, these are important matters, and I think it's good that the appointment of judges is being debated. I think for your point, Anki, the, the, um, the mafia of advisors advising states and proceedings, um, the spotlight is not quite on in the same way, but I think we're seeing the same, that um, states will be, will be want, certain states will be wanting to be seen, not just to be going with the experienced safe pairs of hands, but also bringing diversity to their teams. A final point more briefly, your last question was about do we have at the moment in this era the people who will, through their impressive uh, personality and their power of persuasion, um, urge upon the international community significant steps forward? Well, I do not know. I think we may not have them in the human rights field at the moment. It may be that the, the frontiers are different ones. Um, and in some ways, I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking as an expert. I'm speaking as a newspaper reader. Two, two thoughts. I mean, I think we may have had those in the international criminal justice movement, um, where 20 years ago we've seen significant strides, perhaps less pushed by the Winston Churchills of the era, but by a determined coalition of people who wanted to make a significant advancement. Um, we're seeing it now, and this is where I'm tying things to um, Veselin uh, Popovsky's uh, point about an, an environmental court, and my current setting in Glasgow at the, as the site of the environmental summit, we may be seeing something like that in the climate change field now, where we have the same need for personalities to lead by example and to impress through vision. Um, and we may not have them. The century is short on Churchill's, perhaps for the better, more than for the worse. But, um, but they may come from different eras and uh, they, they may come from different fields. And it seems to me that uh, the field where we're looking most attentively at the moment is climate change governance, which is the current Glasgow topic because uh, we're three days away from the end of the, or five days away from the end of the summit, which takes momentous decisions in this field. That's been a bit of an extemporizing response, but your questions were diverse, so my answers were too. Thank you. Diverse, precise, and laser sharp. Thank you so much, Professor Tams. It's been an honor to host you and to hear your expert thoughts. We will now, I will echo the words of Professor Busk and extend the invitation to re-invite you to our campus and to our country. And we look forward to engaging with you 
in our future discussions, events, and publications. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Many thanks. It's been a pleasure and privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.